Well, I think I'm just going to dive into some of the housekeeping since we do have a pretty packed agenda today. Um, first of all, just good morning. Welcome to everyone. Um, this is our last peer networking session of the year. Um, again, if you haven't done so already, please sign your name in the chat box. Um, I'd also be great to know uh, your agency or organization that you work for um, and where you're joining from. Um, just some pieces of housekeeping. Uh, we ask that you keep your microphones and videos off during the panel presentations. Um, we'll have about 15 minutes. We have four presentations today. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes per presentation and then five minutes of questions and answers uh, following each one. Um, to ask questions, please use the chat box to type your question. Uh, myself or other PSRC staffers will be monitoring the chat box and be able to relay the question to the panelists. Following the presentations, we'll take about a five minute break and then dive right into breakout discussions for about 30 minutes. At that time, we encourage you to turn your cameras and microphones on um, so that we can have uh, some engaging small group discussions. Um, and PSRC staff will be on hand in each breakout room to kind of answer any questions or just kind of help facilitate. Um, one important note is that the panel presentations are being recorded today, um, and those will be, be posted to our website um, along with the presentation slides. Uh, if you're having any technical issues, please use the chat to message PSRC staff um, or just email me if that's not an option for you. Um, my email is bcon at psrc.org. Um, and then just the last note is that we're offering two AICP credits for attending this event. So please uh, remember to log your credits on the APA website. So moving into the panel presentations, uh, we're excited to bring to you today a really fantastic set of speakers to share how they're using and employing equitable engagement techniques in local planning efforts. Um, just a little bit about why this topic is important for us and for this region. We know that traditional um, and typical engagement practices are not effective at including and involving all voices in the planning process. Uh, more and more, we're seeing that cities and public agencies are taking chances and trying new things to get more people involved that haven't that have been historically excluded in these planning processes. Um, so, for that reason, we're really excited to showcase how cities and public agencies in our region are rethinking engagement and considering bold ideas. So today we'll hear from the city of Burien, the city of Linwood, um, who's working with BHC Consultants, uh, the Pierce Conservation District, and our own uh, Puget Sound Regional Council uh, about some of these new ideas that are taking place. Uh, so for our first panel presentation, we'll hear from Alex Hunt. Alex is a planner uh, with the city of Burien's Community Development Department. Alex is going to discuss the equitable engagement techniques that are being used in the Ambam and Boulevard Park community plans, um, and in particular, how the use of informal community conversations have informed those plans. Um, in addition to managing these two plans, Alex is also managing the development of long range strategic planning and amendments to Burian's comprehensive plan and municipal code. And I'll turn it over to Alex and we'll give him a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Sharing my screen. Take it away. All right. Can everyone see that all right? Yes. Sure. Sorry. Great. Yes. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much to PSRC for inviting me to uh, speak this morning. I'm Alex Hunt, a planner with the City of Burien Community Development Department. Uh, and I actually won't be presenting specifically on Burien's comprehensive plan, but rather two sub area plans uh, that the city is currently developing uh, and the engagement that has taken place with these two plans. So to put this project into context, the two sub areas in question here are the Ambon Corridor and Boulevard Park, both located in North Burien. And while both of these areas are distinct and separate from each other, uh, the plan development for both areas is happening concurrently under one planning process. Uh, and city staff are working with a consultant team led by makers, architecture, and urban design on that plan document. Uh, so the Ambon corridor is uh, a north-south arterial that connects Burien to White Center and West Seattle. 
Uh, and then the corridor is also the future home of the Metro Rapid Ride H line, which will begin operating uh, in 2022 and will replace Route 120. And then moving over to Boulevard Park, uh, that's located up in the uh, northeast uh, section of Burien. Uh, it's adjacent to SeaTac, uh, Tukwila, and the North High Line unincorporated area. And Boulevard Park was annexed uh, to Burien in 2010. This neighborhood has a, a strong sense of identity uh, as its own neighborhood and is organized around a small commercial core at the corner of Des Moines Memorial Drive uh, and South 120th Street, which serves as kind of the de facto neighborhood center. Uh, this neighborhood hasn't seen much investment since its annexation in 2010. Uh, and Burien's city council wants to give attention to the needs and priorities of this neighborhood uh, through this sub area planning process. So our broad purpose at the outset of the project was to plan for transit oriented development along the Ambon corridor to complement the rapid right H line and in Boulevard Park support a thriving mixed use center with supportive land uses. While throughout the process for both sub areas, ensuring that the outcomes of the plan uh, impacts these neighborhoods equitably. So for this project, equitable, and equitable engagement means amplifying the voices of people who stand to be impacted by these plans, but do not typically wield influence uh, over our city planning processes. Uh, and I'll expand on that uh, a little later on. So we started with these broad goals for the project outcome, uh, but to really understand the community vision for these two neighborhoods, we obviously needed to work directly with community members, which brings us to the engagement phase of our project. And as a disclaimer, we are still uh, in the middle of this project. We have not yet concluded the preliminary engagement phase uh, for the Ambom and Boulevard Park community plans. So we don't have the benefit of a retrospective view of the project, and there's still definitely a lot of learning as we go uh, taking place. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is just highlight a few different pieces of our engagement approach so far, starting with informal community conversations. Uh, early in the project, we started by just meeting one-on-one -on -one with folks who have a stake in the future of the Amlon Corridor and Boulevard Park. That includes residents, business owners, uh, representatives of nonprofit organizations, staff from other public agencies, developers, members of Burien's various boards and commissions. And these conversations were kind of our way to dip our toes in and start understanding people's priorities as they relate to these two neighborhoods. Uh, and now that so many people are pretty comfortable with video calls. It's really easy to set up just half hour meetings to, to chat with people. With these one-on-one -on -one conversations, people tend to be a bit more open and honest and conversations go to more unexpected and organic places than in a structured engagement activity or, or a charrette, for example. So not only have we discussed with people and, and learned about what people's visions are for Ambon and Boulevard Park, People have also referred us to other folks in the community that we should be talking to. They've let us know what other cities and organizations are doing. Uh, they've offered constructive criticism on the way Burien has done its community engagement in the past. So this ongoing piece of our community engagement approach has allowed us to make new connections within the community. Uh, and it's made our project team within the city a lot more accessible to, to people who want to tap into the project and make their voices heard. So we acknowledge that we'll never be able to do uh, perfect engagement and reach every single person that we want to reach. But connecting with the community throughout the entire plan development process with these one on one conversations allows us to make contact with uh, a lot of folks who are less likely to attend those formal city-led engagement events. And then from these informal community conversations that took place at the beginning of the process, we were able to recruit about a dozen folks to be a part of our advisory group. Uh, the role of the advisory group is to have community perspective and expertise guiding project uh, direction from, from start to finish. So far, uh, the advisory group was met just once uh, back in August. And while the meeting was held virtually on Zoom, 
Group members were able to collaborate in real time to document assets, challenges, opportunities, uh, insights on those two neighborhoods. So the map shown here is the result of the first advisory group meeting. Uh, we use Miro, which is a, a web-based whiteboard tool so that participants were able to provide geographically specific feedback directly on the neighborhood map. So we were all collaborating and, and marking up this neighborhood map as we discussed, uh, discussed the two areas. And then using Miro uh, seemed to be a really effective way to support this type of uh, real-time collaborative workshopping activity. But we did get some feedback that the technology was too complex for some, um, which meant that they felt that they weren't able to fully participate. So uh, we'll, we'll be reconsidering our approach to virtual advisory group meetings uh, and the accessibility of the tools that we're using as part of those meetings. And then also back in August, we launched an online interactive map to spread awareness on the project and receive input from community members on, on what they love about AMBOM and Boulevard Park and what should be improved or changed. Uh, the map provides background information on the project, lets, us, lets the community know what we're doing, how they can reach us. Uh, and it allows folks to navigate around the two neighborhoods and place markers on specific locations where they would like to make a comment. So each of the colorful symbols that you see on the map here marks a comment that someone has placed on the map. And anyone who uses that map can see comments that have been made, they can respond to other folks' comments, and they can indicate whether they like or dislike the comment. Uh, being able to see people's comments linked to specific locations uh, on a tool that's open and accessible to, to a lot of people helps to really focus our, our understanding of the community vision, goals, and objectives uh, for the community planning process here in Boulevard Park and the Ambon Corridor. So our goal was we wanted to provide an open opportunity for everyone, all community members to share their thoughts and to be able to see what their neighbors are saying. But we also acknowledge that a web-based tool like this can be challenging for some users uh, who are not as comfortable with technology. It's kind of the same thing we see with the Miro board uh, that we use with the advisory group meeting. So to push the tool to be a bit more accessible, we filmed a video uh, that plays when you open the web page. Uh, it has a visual tutorial that walks people through how to navigate the map and how to provide comments. And then we also provided written instructions in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, uh, Berean's three most commonly spoken languages. Um, so as we continue to use digital tools in our planning, uh, I think we realized it's important that we need to focus our energy uh, on how we deploy those tools to make sure we're not leaving people behind and cutting them out of the engagement process as a result. And then as I mentioned, it's really important that equity be intentionally centered in the development of these uh, sub-area plans. So makers and city of Burien staff developed an equity framework that guides the planning process to ensure that the project creates uh, proportionate benefits and burdens on varying communities. And a piece of creating equitable outcomes is focusing energy on vulnerable communities. For example, BIPOC communities, lower income people, people with disabilities. Within the equity framework, we visualize our engagement focus with this matrix. Uh, if you look at the matrix here, that vertical axis shows the level of impact that the project has on people. So higher up is people who are more impacted by the project. And then this horizontal axis is uh, the level of influence that people typically wield within uh, city processes and planning processes. So we are really prioritizing and focusing in, uh, devoting our energy and resources to the people who are more impacted by the plan and do not typically uh, wield as much power or influence on, on city processes. So this, this matrix is a helpful way for us to, to visualize that focus. And then a common critique that we've heard um, on Burien's engagement methods is that we're often repetitive and reach 
the same community members project after project while failing to reach folks who will be most impacted by our plans? So to better reach the communities who are not typically brought into our engagement and who are likely to be impacted by these community plans, the project team is working with Burien resident and community leader, uh, Roxana Pardo Garcia. Roxana is someone who I met a few months ago early in the process uh, of these plans uh, through those informal community conversations. Roxana's consultancy, uh, La Roxay Productions, works to ampl amplify community experience and truth through knowledge sharing. Roxana has deep ties within the Burian community. She's, she's from Burian. Uh, and we've brought her on as a consultant on our project team to ensure that we are accountable to the Burian community and that we are conducting meaningful and equitable engagement. So Roxana is working with us to facilitate what we're calling focused engagement events. The goal with these events is to minimize the barriers to public participation and reach folks where they are so that they can make their voices heard in a way that's comfortable and relevant to them. Uh, these focused engagement events aim to reach members of Burian's Vietnamese community and folks served by the three organizations shown at the top here. Uh, Para Los Niños, that's a nonprofit that supports the education of Latino children. Southwest Youth and Family Services, an organization that uh, provides critical services in significantly under-resourced communities of Southwest King County. And Alimentando El Pueblo, uh, that's an organization that works to ensure communities have access to culturally specific foods. Uh, and then separate meetings will be held uh, just for youth served by Carlos Niños and Southwest Youth and Family Services, so that we're capturing uh, the youth perspective as well, uh, which is sometimes overlooked in planning processes uh, and engagement. So, so far, two of these engagements, uh, or sorry, two of these focused engagement events rather, have taken place in partnership with Southwest Youth and Family Services. And we have met with residents of the Alcove Apartments along the Ambon Corridor and Woodridge Park Apartments in Boulevard Park. Both focused engagement events tapped into existing community group meetings for women's groups that meet weekly. Uh, and both meetings were held entirely in Spanish. So by joining a community meeting that's already going to take place, we got solid participation numbers within a group of people who already trust each other, already feel comfortable being open with one another. And then holding the meeting in Spanish was also key. Uh, some of our other engagement events are held in English and provide live interpretation to Spanish, but you lose a bit of the conversational flow with live interpretation. Uh, and people may be a little less likely to speak up or contribute if the meeting is held primarily in English and English isn't a language that they're comfortable with. So another uh, important piece of this process in working with makers and law roadside productions, we decided that providing stipends to participants uh, in these focused engagement of meetings was non-negotiable. Uh, a crucial part of equitable engagement is, is offering that payment to folks who are donating their time to you or giving you their time. So these are just a few quick highlights from our engagement so far. Like I said, we are still very much in the middle of this project, so there's a lot more to come and a lot more lessons to be learned from our engagement process. Uh, but I am happy to address any question that folks may have at this time. Excellent, thank you, Alex. That was really, really great. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in. Actually, I think the only genre of question I see so far is um, a lot of interest in under or knowing what kind of software you're using for the online mapping, online interactive map. Yeah, so uh, that's hosted by Social Pinpoint is the name of the software using for the online interactive map. And makers uh, help us to develop that. Great, great. Um, there is a request to uh, share the framework slide again. I think that there was a lot of um, interest and enthusiasm in the equity framework. Yeah, I'd be happy and to. And then while that is being pulled up, there's a question from Tiernan Martin. Do you see any role for creators, artists, or musicians in this engagement process? Definitely. Uh, we have 
been working with the Arts Commission. Uh, we've heard a lot about public art and kind of bringing more vibrancy to spaces that um, don't have that. Uh, so public art is something that people bring up a lot. And I think that there are definitely opportunities as we implement this plan to bring in uh, local artists, local uh, you know, musicians as well to, to populate some of the uh, community spaces that we wanna see. Um, but yeah, we are, we are working with the Beery and Arts Commission to see how we can bring that in. Great. Um, another question coming from Amy Powell. Um, I think this is a good one too. Uh, if we want to build trust with the community in the long run, would engagement be better facilitated by staff or by a consultant? I think you have to have staff showing their faces at as much as possible and um, kind of trying to form authentic relationships as well. Uh, We've had, I think when you have an opportunity to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and actually go out to where they're, where they are, it, it, you feel more like a person and less like a government entity, which I think is important in building that trust. Um, so we've had a lot of success with, again, those informal conversations um, that are, are done with city staff. Uh, I've gone out with Roxana to Boulevard Park to just talk to business owners and let them know what we're up to. Um, so I think for long-term relationships with people in the community, staff have to be the part of that process so that, um, you know, the staff are the constant, the, the, the consultants will be elsewhere after the project's done, but the staff are going to stay. So the staff need to be part of that. Great. So just one more question, I think, before we uh, head into the next panel presentation. Um, were there any unexpected challenges with holding a meeting in Spanish? Uh, yeah, my Spanish is a little rustier than I thought it was. Um, luckily, Roxana was uh, doing most of the, the speaking. Um, the language part was not, didn't, pose a, a real significant challenge. Luckily, we have a few city staff members who are, are pretty fluent in Spanish. So that's makes that a, a lot easier. We were able to staff, we were able to work directly with Roxana and Law Rock State Productions to make that happen. Um, but the language itself wasn't really a, a big challenge. And I think it really made a difference to be able to, to offer that to folks who are already having a, a meeting in Spanish. Great. So one more question did sneak by. Um, Melissa, if you don't mind, I think we'll we'll save this uh, to the end just because we are running one minute behind now. Um, but with that, I uh, want to thank Alex. I uh, thought that was a great way to start this off today. Um, I personally, I live really close to Ambam, so I think for me, it was, it was exciting to hear more about that just on a personal level. Um, switching gears though, uh, I wanna welcome Ashley Wenschel and Talia Tittlefitz who are here to share uh, how equitable engagement has informed the South Linwood neighborhood plan. So moving from Burien to Linwood uh, and more specifically how they have implemented a co-design committee um, as part of the plan and how that's informing it. Uh, so Ashley is the community planning manager for the city of Linwood and is currently leading the South Linwood neighborhood plan, as well as the 2024 comprehensive plan update. Ashley's work is focused on recentering planning efforts around community voices and creating spaces for open and safe dialogue. Ta Talia is a senior planner at BHC Consultants. Uh, she has nearly 15 years of planning experience across Washington cities, counties, and tribes, updating comprehensive plans sub area plans, park plans, and land use development codes. So it's quite a lot of experience at different levels. And she in particular loves helping small towns and making sure everyone's voices gets heard. So uh, we're also really uh, happy to have Ashley and Talia with us. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. 
Hi, so I'm Ashley Winchell, Community Planning Manager for the City of Linwood, and we are going to talk to you today about our South Linwood Neighborhood Plan. So we are, I think now, smack dab in the middle of the adoption process. We were at Planning Commission last night for a public hearing and got the recommendation to move forward to Council. So we can share um, the website for this plan if you all are interested in, in seeing where we are. Um, but the South Linwood neighborhood uh, is located in between our city center, which is where uh, uh, the light, what, light, Linwood Light Rail Link Extension is currently under construction and between Highway 99 to the west. And so this neighborhood is situated in between two areas we're experiencing growth. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting neighborhood in terms of the fact, I mean, it has the inner urban trail going through it. Um, there's light industrial zoning, heavy commercial, commercial, neighborhood commercial, multifamily and single family. So it's probably our most diverse neighborhood in terms of land uses. It's really a hodgepodge where you're on one block and it's single family, you're on the next block, it's industrial, and then you go another block over and it's all apartments. So um, why did we decide to do a sub area plan for South Linwood? Um, first off, this plan was recommended in the 2015 Economic Development Action Plan um, as an effort for a revitalization plan for South Linwood. In 2016, with our park plan update, the Parks Department um, looked at a number of different equity factors to pinpoint neighborhoods in Linwood, which may be experiencing inequities. And South Linwood was identified. Um, South Linwood hi is highlighted here in the dashed uh, black outline. So some of the things uh, we know about the neighborhood is it's about 50-50 on renters and home ownership. Um, and we've not heard a lot from our renter community um, in the past. South Linwood has about twice the percentage of Hispanic populations compared to the city as a whole, and about twice the percentage of adults and three times the percentage of children speaking Spanish primarily in the home. Uh, residents in South Linwood have lower incomes and a higher percentage of people below the poverty line compared to the city. Um, again, a real hodgepodge of land uses, and then immediately west is uh, our future light rail station, and so there's a lot of development pressure there. Uh, with all of this in mind, um, and, and then I, after we went out for the RFP, um, the PSRC displacement risk maps uh, were published and, and highlighted Linwood as, or South Linwood as a neighborhood experiencing uh, potential risk of displacement. So in 2019, we issued an RFP for sub area plan and contact contracted with BHC. And our biggest focus was on engaging the community and hearing from a wide range of community members, both renters, homeowners, business owners, and service providers. So I'm gonna pass it to Talia to talk about um, how we got to our engagement efforts for this project. Great, thank you. So. Um... So yeah, after uh, our consultant team was brought on, we had um, was BHC with BDS Planning and Urban Design and Echo Northwest. And, um, and BDS was really sort of taking charge of the sort of the opening shots of the public engagement. And um, one of the things that they brought to this project was this concept of pre-engagement. So they said, we need to have a very honest conversation with city staff about what's worked and what hasn't worked in the past, what's been tried, what is perceived to have failed, um, and who do you know, who do you wanna work with? Um, and then getting out into the community and talking to the community members about how they wanna be engaged. And I think in a lot of um, community engagement processes I've been involved in, you know, in the past, this would have been the entirety of the engagement process, you know, going out to street fairs, having focused one on one conversations. Um, and, you know, some of what Alex is talking about the snowball of like, who else should we talk to who else, um, who else is out there? Who else do we, who are the leaders that we need to be in touch with and bring in. Um, and the public engagement plan was actually written after the pre-engagement was completed. Um, so we were also conducting a detailed survey of the or report about the demographics and characteristics of the neighborhood. And the pre-engagement results were folded into that. So this is like our package understanding of what is going on in South Linwood. 
Um, and um, you can see here some of our, we've got Ashley in some of these pictures <laughs> um, and um, Ben Hahn and Asana Nove who are sub-consultants to BDS. Um, so yeah, I think that was really, um, for me, that was a, a great sort of first step into the neighborhood, just asking them, how do you wanna be engaged? This is you know, the, what we're thinking about doing, who do we need to talk to and, and, and what are your priorities about how this needs to happen? So some of our findings from pre-engagement, which led us to our public engagement plan include that community organizations are looking to the city for opportunities to partner in engaging the South Linwood community. And that authentic and mutual partnership includes shared responsibility in the development, design, implement, and implementation of city initiatives and projects. We also found that community engagement for the project needs to not just be about the built environment, but also about the livability of South Linwood. Um, we also heard that the city should increase feedback communication and that additional outreach and engagement strategies should be made to target all underrepresented populations. Um, that includes our non-English speaking populations, other faith communities, folks with disabilities, and the LGBTQA plus communities. The city should also be more proactive in reaching out to residents on impactful planning projects and information of existing resources and programs and all communication for the Southlandwood neighborhood uh, plan should speak to its longevity. And then finally, that engagement with the community should include deeper dialogue and advocacy around systems change. So all of that information and what we heard from the neighborhood um, led to our engagement plan, um, which focused on the co-design committee. And I'll have Talia talk about that effort. So there was sort of a multi-pronged approach um, as far as reaching out to everybody and the, sort of the central focus of this was, as Ashley said, this co-design committee. And um, a co-design is really the idea that um, those who have a strong interest in participating, those will be the most impacted by the planning process. And for this plan, those who typically haven't had their voices necessarily heard in planning processes and Linwood before are going to be equal partners at the table with the city and for the co-design committee structure we um, ended up having consultants facilitate the meetings I mean the consultant and city staff team would plan the meetings but the consultants would actually facilitate in the moment so that city members participating in the meetings were sort of equal listening partners um, um, at the table. Um, we, in forming the co-design committee, we were actively reaching into the community to try to find people that the city hadn't engaged with before. And we had a lot of discussions about how do we, what are, what might the barriers be for some of these folks to participate and how can we remove them? So this included, you know, technology gaps or even um, paying for people's time or childcare or food. Um, and uh, we initially had planned to have four in-person meetings and we had one in-person meetings and the pandemic hit. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and we ended up having nine meetings total. So um, based on how it was going and how the co-design committee was responding to this process um, and sort of some of the adjustments taking everything virtually, um, we ended up with, with nine different meetings. Um, and I think the, the biggest framework that we took um, in terms of thinking about each of these meetings uh, that we took out of the pre-engagement findings was that the city wanted collaboration with, I'm sorry, the, the community wanted collaboration with the city and the community wanted collaboration with each other. And so that was in our mind, you know, obviously we wanna get feedback from the neighborhood about, you know, how to, how to write this uh, neighborhood plan, um, but our, but almost an equal and sometimes even bigger goal for us was to make sure that community members came out of these meetings getting to know each other, feeling like they were getting to know their neighbors, getting to understand their own neighborhood, um, and um, forming alliances with the city, but also with each other that would endure beyond, uh, beyond these co-design committee meetings and beyond the adoption of the plan. Um, and some of the... Uh, 
original some of the initial meetings were had had to do with vision setting and um, towards the middle a lot of the meetings had to do with education so topics that the committee wanted to be educated on about light, you know what is light industrial uh, what is connectivity what is what's going on with housing in Linwood um, and the last two meetings were actually review of the document we shared with them 60% and 90% drafts of the neighborhood plan and we had a very detailed conversation with them of going through and checking in did we capture what it was that um, that you were telling us and does this plan sort of match um, your notions of your neighborhood and your community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our, we did some engagement this summer um, with the wider community and really the intent of that engagement was to make sure that what we were hearing from the co-design committee represented the neighborhood as, as a whole. Um, and we were able to compare this engagement with our pre-engagement, and, and the reason I'm showing this slide to you all is because both engagement efforts looked really different. Uh, pre-engagement was mostly in person, going to events, talking to people, using paper surveys, um, and then because of our, our limitations with COVID, our 2021 survey, um, which we completed in June, was predominantly online. We did have some opportunities to go out in the community with paper surveys, but those were limited because we also wanted to be super conscious of, of spaces we were entering and um, making sure that it was somewhere that people knew they would see other people and that we weren't entering into people's spaces during a pandemic uninvited. Um, and so really what, what, what we found in this is just knowing the limitations of your tool and knowing, um, you know, kind of if you're trying to reach certain communities, what's the best tool to get to those communities but then also um, one of the things we also tried to focus on is knowing the limitation of our online tool, are there ways that we can elevate certain voices in our memo that we, we present out because when you put everything together, something may come out as moderately important, but if you pull out specific demographic groups, some of these things may be way more important to them. And we wanted to make sure that when we presented this to council and we worked on the plan that, um, you know, if it was, connecting people to jobs or affordability for renters or um, a number of different things that the groups that were most impacted that we made sure that we provided what they felt about that information so that it wasn't lost in the overall opinion um, within the neighborhood. And so you'll see in our 2021 survey, you know, we're overrepresented in our white population, underrepresented in our um, Latino or Hispanic population, and definitely overrepresented in our um, homeowner versus renter population, whereas in our 2019 pre-engagement, we really got to about 50-50. Um, some of the things, I, I will, I'll quickly go over some of the things we did in 2021 just to try to get the word out to as many folks as possible. Um, because we built such a strong relationship with our co-design committee, they actually volunteered we didn't ask them, but they volunteered to um, put door hangers up around the neighborhood. And so we ended up, I think, between the city and uh, the co-design committee getting out about 400 door hangers um, in the neighborhood uh, that had information directing people online to the survey. Um, the information was in English and Spanish. Um, we went to, we worked with HASCO, which is our, our housing authority of Snohomish County. Um, and we uh, printed out surveys in both English and Spanish. We put envelopes with stamps in a, a baggie and they put them on the doors of the different properties that they manage within the neighborhood. Um, uh, Kristen Holdsworth, our, our senior planner and I went to the neighborhood and just walked around and like chased people down on the street and tried to get them to do surveys. Um, there was a food drop off uh, or pickup program for the Edmond School District where we um, went to those sites and talked to folks to get them to do the survey. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that the survey we did on paper, uh, we shortened that, trying to respect people's time and understanding that you give people one sheet of paper and ask them to fill out a survey, they're going to be uh, a lot more likely to do it than when you hand them a stapled package and ask them to uh, spend some time on that, especially when they have kiddos around and are just trying to get in and out somewhere. And so we were uh, able to get um, 
210 responses uh, in that 2021 survey. And so I would say to um, through email blasts and getting out to the community in different ways, uh, I don't think I've ever worked on a neighborhood plan where we've actually been able to get that many folks to participate. Um, I think I've worked on a lot of plans where we made bets as to whether there would be 10 or 20 people that showed up. Um, and so it was, it was, I think, a really great way to try to balance needing to meet people where they are, both in person and online. And then finally, the, the last thing I think we found through this is, is kind of understanding what mind space people will be in when you do approach them in person. And the community isn't always prepared to talk about planning issues. And so making sure things are worded in a way that normal people would talk that way, not like how you would talk to your planner friends about community issues. Um, and, and that I think was a huge, huge uh, lesson we learned throughout this project. So um, finally, just some of our takeaways from the co-design uh, committee. Uh, the first one I would, I would just say is getting to know your community before you engage them. Um, and the pre-engagement really, I mean, it helped us not only form some vision for the plan, but understand what's going to be successful and who we should be talking to. Um, Talia talked about, about our co-design committee getting to hear each other. And one of the things I think was really successful about that is establishing ground rules early and, and sticking to them. And I think that built a lot of respect before, between the co-design committee members. They didn't always agree on everything, but they were extremely respectful of each other's opinions. And I think they got to points where they could understand where other people were coming from. Um, steady communication. So this, this wasn't done without a series of potential hiccups throughout the process. I mean, starting engagement and that was mostly planned to be in person and then uh, having to switch to something online. There were definitely moments where we were just trying to figure out what was going on next and we were talking to each other, the city and the consultant team, but we weren't communicating that back out to the co-design committee. And so, um, you know, we did have to rebuild some trust and relationships with them because they hadn't heard from us in a while. Um, again, mutual respect between the participants is super important. Um, I, I think that at the end of this, um, they got to know each other really well and were able to support each other's opinions and also make space for each other. Um, and then also just from the city's end, our job was really to um, I'll combine four and five, but our job was to listen and to, you know, I think there was a lot of times where conversations would be moving along and I had to step back and think, should I respond to what I'm hearing or should I just absorb this? And I think, you know, there is a tendency sometimes um, if you're the subject matter expert to want to throw in little facts and pieces of information and understanding that it's not always helpful and it's not always helping build trust. And so letting the conversation flow sometimes I think from the city's end really helped us build trust with the co-design committee that we were here to hear their ideas and let them brainstorm, but not here to put them in their place or tell them things are different than how they're saying them. One and of the on. things we yeah. had the city staff do was they acted as our note takers. And so this actually worked really well so that you know, if we had breakout groups to make the group smaller and more personable, when the, um, uh, you know, when the city staff would read back from their notes, then it really gave the the community participants a chance to see that their eyes had ideas had been heard and recorded. Yeah, yeah, I think that was a huge lesson for us of like, just if they hear the city saying it back, it's it's really confirming that that they were heard. And I think this goes back to a question that Alex was asked about um, how should the city be engaged? And what we found in this process is because we were, we were at the table with the co-design committee, um, facilitating the meetings needed to go to a more neutral party um, because the power dynamic definitely shifted if I'm asking the questions versus Talia asking the questions or me presenting something or, or versus Talia presenting something. And we definitely uh, kind of during some of our, when we were trying to figure out what to do about COVID and how we were going to engage people, we did have one meeting where 
um, the city just met with the co-design committee and the dynamic completely changed. And even how our co-design committee reacted was really different than what we were used to. And a lot of that, I think, had to do with the facilitation of us moving to the power of leading the meeting versus we're there as an equal participant. Um, one of the things Talia mentioned was providing education to our co-design committee. And really, we're, we were talking to a group of community folks about zoning and land use. And it's a group of folks who don't talk about that on a regular basis. And so making sure that before we ask them questions about what they think, that we're providing them enough information and background to understand what these concepts are and how they impact their neighborhood. Um, and so that, that I think was really helpful in just taking the 30 minutes beforehand to talk to them about things. And I think we learned a lot too in, in terms of you know, we had a whole meeting about light industrial. And then the first draft, we had all of these policies about light industrial zoning and all of the co-design committee members were like, well, where, when do we talk about businesses? Like, this is, this is all about light industrial and why is it at the beginning? And it kind of was a, an eye opener for me of like, maybe we don't need to talk about the name of the zone. Maybe we just need to talk about what's happening and, and translate that into the plan we don't necessarily have to use our jargon to have a conversation about something. Um, and, and that gets to using their language. It's not just, you know, whether it's English or Spanish or Korean, but saying things the way that they would say them and talk about them. We, we had one co-design committee member who wanted to have a separate conversation about commercial properties. And when I talked to her, I realized that she really just wanted to talk about businesses in the neighborhood and didn't distinguish between light industrial, heavy co commercial neighborhood business. She just wanted to talk about things that weren't residential in the neighborhood. And because we had framed the meeting around light industrial, she had felt that conversation didn't happen. But then when we talked, it was a very identical conversation. And it kind of clicked for me that we didn't use her language. And I think it clicked for her that, oh, we talked about this. We just didn't call it what I would have called it. Um, and so that was, was really important. And I think there's also a power balance in what language we use. If we're using a bunch of planner jargon, it kind of comes across of like, we have the knowledge and the ability to tell you what's happening in your neighborhood and, and can be intimidating to folks. And then finally, um, understanding the limitations of your tools and how to compensate for that. So how do you present the information? What do you need to do to get additional information out to folks? Um, and just really focusing on, um, you know, we're all limited in whether it's in funds or time um, and, and can't have perfect engagement efforts, but how can we um, emphasize certain things to get as close to perfect as what we're working with as possible? I think too that meant that some when we ended up having to transition to having our co-design committee meetings online, we always had backup staff to provide breakout rooms if we had more than like six or seven co-design committee members. Because we wanted these conversations to have enough co-design committee members to get a conversation going, but not so many that they would feel like their voices were being drowned out. And also outside of the presentations that we gave at the beginning, sort of providing education, we turned our screen shares off. We wanted, we literally wanted faces to be as big as possible so they could see each other and they could see how everybody else was responding. So that was another key too, was like a limitation of the, you know, of a, of a Zoom meeting is that like you can't see everybody in the room if you've got 25 people and you're not all on the same screen so um so really just working hard to try to limit screen sharing so we could see each other's faces and understand each other's responses um, and so it was a big jump for some of our folks to even participate in a zoom meeting whereas you know prior to covid they didn't even really like to send information via email so um so really just like keeping our tools very, very, very simple. We had to talk ourselves back over and over and over again from wanting to use like fancy online tools. And we just ended up deciding like, it's just gonna be frustrating for our participants and we won't allow, you know, what do we want to happen? We want them to collaborate with each other. We want them to form alliances with each other. And that's not gonna happen if they're completely focused on like learning a new tool in the middle of also trying to provide feedback to us. Yeah, and, and then I think 
in addition to tool limitations though, toward the end, I think that Zoom provided, we had a couple co-design committee members who were folks that were more likely to engage us one-on-one -on -one or not as likely to speak up in a meeting. And the chat feature became like a way for them to provide input without moving outside of their comfort zone. And so we did have a few co-design committee members who would maybe just send their opinion via chat, but weren't necessarily going to say something out loud or, or, or raise their hand. And um, it definitely helped us to balance that we had some really strong voices and personalities in the co-design committee and some folks too that were a little more reserved. And so, you know, I think Zoom, Zoom really provided more opportunity in some ways for us to have that feedback with some of our members. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and we're happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, thank you. That was really, really great. I know we had a lot of engagement there and there are uh, a few questions popping in. So uh, yeah, I think we can get to a few of them. Um, first one is from Amy Pau. Uh, how did the city choose the co-design community members? Kind of a straightforward one to start. <laughs> The part of the pre-engagement process was sort of this process of discovery and, you know, the, the, the boundary that the city drew around South Linwood was not, it wasn't necessarily a self-identified neighborhood. It didn't have a pre-existing strong neighborhood identity or there weren't already neighborhood groups. There were like small affinity groups within, but they weren't necessarily South Linwood groups. Um, and so... So I think the starting place was like, who who do we know? Who can we talk to? Who did we reach out to during the pre-engagement? Are they interested? Do they have the time? And then who else are they recommending that we talk to? Uh, two of our like co-design superstars, I think came into the co-design committee like a week before the meeting because someone told them about it and they called me and it, it kind of felt like, all right, well, you want to participate and you're really eager to participate. So why kind of why not? And they ended up, I mean, I think came to every meeting, provided excellent feedback, super, they were just superstars. And, and I think just being open to hearing folks, even if you're like, well, I already sent out invites, like making sure that you're you're just being open to folks that you don't know that aren't those known entities in the neighborhood. And I think there was a deliberate effort too on the city's uh, side to try to balance the as best as possible the makeup of the co-design committee, just in terms of who we were inviting in. Like, do we do we have representation? Yeah. Um, there's Gwen's question about action versus policy. How action versus policy oriented was the plan? Um, and were the co-design committee members satisfied with the deliverable and how would it be carried forward? Well, we're, we're still in the process of adopting the plan. Um, I think I think the co-design committee members seem to be fairly satisfied, at least those that um, stuck it out to the end were quite happy with um, how they were able to be involved and how they were able to see their influence over the plan taking place. Like we gave them a 60% draft of the plan and they had a lot of questions and we completely reorganized everything and sent back a 75% draft. So that by the time we got to around to discussing the 90% draft with them, which is where all of the, we had discussed the goals and policies, but the actions didn't show up until 90%. Um, you know, they were very excited and on board um, and mostly just glad to have been part of a process that was so slowed down. I think the fact that they had that many opportunities to learn and to discuss and to provide their feedback, it wasn't just like expecting all of this feedback to come to us in one meeting or even two. Um, um, and I think, gosh, there were 33 policies and over a hundred actions. I think it's probably a fairly action heavy plan, but, but we'll see <laughs> going forward yeah. how. And, and, and then I would just add to, so on our last meeting, we we started off with kind of an icebreaker question of like, what did you get out of the co-design committee? And I was expecting just like, I learned more about planning and we got really heartfelt responses from our co-design committee members that they felt heard and included 
and that they really enjoyed the process and hadn't participated in something like I think they came in a little bit skeptical and they they were really happy to have participated in a city project where they could look at the document and see how they were heard in it and then last night at our planning commission meeting we we let all the co-design committee members know like if you want to come talk please do we think it'd be really great you know for the planning commission to hear your experience and um, we had three co-design committee members come and talk about how heard they felt how proud they were of the plan and i don't think i've ever worked on a plan where the stakeholder group for lack of a better term had so much pride or or connection to the plan themselves a lot of times i think they kind of felt like yeah i i participated but they didn't necessarily come away feeling like it was their plan and i think our co-design committee members really do feel like this is this is their plan this is their voice um let's see miriam's so, question uh, oh sorry for <laughs> miriam's just yeah looking at miriam's question it's a really really great question um, and I would love to hear kind of how you're thinking about that. But um, our next presentation from Brene from the Pierce Conservation District will go a little bit in more detail about um, compensation. So okay, we'll um, hold I think off we'll on that. One. <laughs> might just get some more information um, okay. available. So yeah, maybe moving. Um, how do you see the difference between absorbing and clarifying? I think that's in relation to the, the takeaways. This is a really good one that's specific to the structure of co-design committee. And um, we had to have, we had to recenter our message with the city staff, you know, at, before every meeting, be like, okay, reminder, here's what our different roles are. Um, and um, I think it's really easy if you're hearing something about an issue that has a lot of past history to be like, well, actually what happened was <laughs> like, you're wrong about how you understand this. What it really is, is this. And we had to just be like, let's let the conversations happen. If we're hearing a lot of information that's not correct, we can go back and fill in later with more communication. But what we want to allow is the conversation to happen organically because if we don't let them talk to each other about it and, and share their thoughts with us, we're just not going to, we may not actually get to the heart of, of, of what these conversations or fears or, or issues are actually about. So I don't know if that answers Melissa's question, but. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of clarification, I, I tried to interject, like if they were talking about speeds and, and like, I think one time they were talking about speeding cars and all of these these different things that make them feel unsafe as pedestrians. And so trying to clarify like, well, why do you think people are speeding and, and what streets are they like trying to get closer to maybe a planning solution for it and confirming that the planning, like as my brain was working of like, okay, I think they want traffic calming, like explaining kind of some theories around things and seeing if that's something they're supportive of versus just saying like, it's because your streets are too wide. That's why, that's why everyone's driving fast. So like trying to like in terms of clarification to provide some ideas from a planning perspective and see if they they bite or if they're like, no, I don't want that. Great. So I think one more before our third panel presentation. Um, from Amy Powell, it looks like Black and Hispanic are underrepresented in the 2021 survey. And uh, were you able to take any extra effort to reach those two population segments? We were not able to necessarily have like focus groups or, or more individualized efforts. And so what we did in our report was pulled out those opinions from those demographic groups and made sure that they were highlighted and elevated beyond that of the, the responses as a whole. But we did have some limitations in terms of project funding to get deeper into the community. And that's something I think moving forward, we're conscious of and thinking about how can we do a better job of that. Great. Well, really appreciate all of the engagement. Really um, thank everyone for submitting questions. Um, at this time, we'll move on to our third panel presentation. If you have managed to take a look at the schedule, you'll notice that we're a little bit over time. 
Um, we are going to, I think, just skip our PSRC presentation. So this will be our final panel presentation here today uh, before we move into the breakout sessions. And um, if you do want to learn more about our work in this field, we'll be able to provide some resources um, afterwards. Uh, so with that, um, I will I want to welcome Renee Meshi. She is the program manager at the Pierce Conservation District on the Harvest Pierce County team. Renee is going to be sharing her work with the Cultural Ambassador Program, which she founded in 2016, and go into detail on the philosophy of what cultural ambassadorship is and community-centered design, and how to get your own agency ready to implement these approaches. Um, and with a special focus on compensation, compensating community members for their lived experience and cultural expertise. Also wanted to note that this is Renee's last day in this role and on Monday, November 1st, she will be joining the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department's Centers for Excellence as a project manager for the Equity Action Collaborative. That was a mouthful. Um, at that, this time I'll welcome Renee. Take it away, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, let me, this part I'm always, slideshow, play from start, there we go. Sorry to make you all witness that. Can you see it full screen? The um, It does look, our, oh, now, there we go. Now it's full screen. Perfect. Okay, it was just lagging. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Renee Meshi, and it is a really interesting time for me to be presenting because today is the last day um, of my time at Pierce Conservation District, and Monday is the first day of that role with um, the Health Department Centers for Excellence. So um, this uh, presentation is a little bit reflective of that because I'm trying to summarize as quickly as I can in just a few slides about seven years uh, of, of this program and then also show the evolution of where that's brought us today and where we hope to go with it, which is the work that I'm hoping to uh, deepen uh, in the role that I start on Monday. So, there's a lot of context here. Some of it I might uh, breeze through a little bit because I feel like seeing our other presenters and just seeing a lot of different collaboratives around equity and engagement uh, just in general lately, I feel like people are getting it. The, the part that's hard for us still is the nuts and bolts of actually how to implement it and how to institutionalize it within our organizations. So um, if it seems like I'm going a little fast through the, the journey of how we got there, that is why. Um, so our initial prioritization for um, the Cultural Ambassadors Program was language access. So in 2016, um, our strategic plan, um, in our strategic planning process, we put increasing equity and language access as program goals. At that point, we didn't have any uh, stated goals. There were things that we had tried to do, but there was nothing official uh, at the strategic plan level. Our top languages, uh, we, we were an urban agriculture program. So our top languages in urban agriculture uh, are Vietnamese, Khmer, Spanish, and Russian. Uh, when I say Russian, I'd like to just disaggregate that it's Russian, Ukrainian, and Moldovan. Um, and Russian is a common language that um, we will use when connecting with those communities, but it kind of gets amalgamated um, in a lot of our, um, in a lot of when we report um, numbers. So our goal was 15%, uh, reaching 15% uh, or making sure that our programming was made up of 15% uh, people with low English proficiency, at least that reflected the demographics of our county. And that was from a figure we found that estimated that 15% of our county had uh, low English proficiency and the top languages of those. Um, and Vietnamese and Spanish are the most prominent languages. So that's where we started, what it's become, and there's there's so much to say here, but again, I'm just gonna breeze through it really quickly. Um, we initially thought that we were gonna be doing a lot of translation and interpretation, but we grew into having parallel events with low English proficiency uh, communities or the communities that tend to have uh, populations with low English proficiency. 
Um, that led to us having events and classes entirely in languages other than English, including on subject matters that were very specific to those communities. And that could have been anything from, for example, a seed saving class on uh, Lufa, which is Huokwa, like a certain kind of, of plant that maybe other people um, weren't growing as, as much in our county or um, you know, technical assistance for things that were very specific. Um, we got a new circle of experts to draw from. So I think uh, the theme of this presentation is, is going to be flipping or at least equalizing power dynamics. So I think the power dynamic when we initially started being an organization that does a lot of education and technical assistance was that we were subject matter experts and we wanted more people to benefit from our expertise, making sure we were reaching more people in the county and that we would interpret kind of in a one-way fashion uh, and translate out to people what we knew and what we were experts in. What we found was our county is so rich uh, in expertise that we couldn't have even imagined uh, before those communication pathways were there. And that includes everything from um, seed saving during the pandemic that became a, a big deal. A lot of people um, in mainstream gardening communities don't save their seeds, but immigrant and refugee gardeners have been saving them since they got here and acclimatizing them. And when food shortages started happening, uh, when the pandemic uh, kicked in, seed saving became a huge interest because it's a skill that a lot of us have forgotten. Um, but there's a, a huge circle of expertise and adapting uh, seeds from different climates to this climate. You know, that's something that's just very specifically uh, necessary and crucial for all of us to learn. And um, it means that we, when we work with ambassadors, we have program leadership from them. It's, um, they're coming up with classes and designing ideas that uh, we wouldn't have ordinarily thought of and supporting those has enriched everybody's experience in our county. Um, we did begin subcontracting for other agencies for special projects and engagement initiatives. So this was like community-based participatory um, research um, in South Tacoma, for example, having a design team. Um, we've done uh, walkability projects with the health department, surveying, um, and each one has kind of brought up kind of different ideas about uh, what the challenges are and how we can refine our systems to uh, allow for ambassador philosophy and model to be something that we can all utilize. I think um, a bad habit that we had gotten into in Pierce County is a lot of organizations would start working with us because it was, we had those pathways laid and it was easier for us to directly contract with community members, for example, or directly support community groups with funds. Um, at some point, I think we were like, well, we should all be able to do this, right? So it shouldn't just be our organization that other agencies connect with us and we connect with community. All of us can do it. Um, so that's kind of a, the part two that I'm leading up to in this presentation. Um, part of our journey over the past six, seven years has been expanding beyond multilingual ambassadors. That model worked really well for multilingual communities, but we also um, use the same model to include what we call community ambassadors. So people with lived experience and cultural expertise in a particular community. It doesn't have to be immigrant or refugee community, it doesn't have to be a language other than English, um, just a population, uh, an identity, uh, a demographic group any demographic group that we want to get in contact with that we don't already have um, communication pathways. Um, it's also resulted in things like building the capacity of local Spanish media. There's a Spanish community radio station that all of our agencies here in Pierce County have been trying to really fortify and build because we realized during the pandemic what an incredible resource community level media and community projects like that are. Um, when the pandemic first hit, we broadcasted city town hall meetings into Spanish for the first time, uh, doing like a simultaneous interpretation feed. Um, things like that help us realize how important it is for us to invest uh, in our local community members and make sure our uh, agency pathways are set up to be able to do that. Um, from 2017 to 2019, we had a Kaiser Permanente partnership with multiple agencies. We had a grant from Kaiser Permanente 
um, and we subcontract, subcontracted with the health department with that grant and utilized it to um, contribute to the momentum of 12 grassroots community-led led events, um, all centering different identities and different demographic groups throughout um, Tacoma and Pierce County, um, and to work alongside ambassadors for things like PMAs. P a PMA is a people's movement assembly. It's a community organizing technique, and it's a way in which people, uh, a method in which people organize around data and take action. Um, I will drop the link in the chat of what a PMA is, um, but it's a community-led process. And our job as agency partners was to support the leadership of the community members that were doing this uh, and essentially help carve the path um, and get out of their way and uh, support that leadership. Uh, and we also worked with um, an interagency kind of work group around this. Um, and paired each ambassador and each ambassador event um, with one of the interagency partners and then kind of liaised their relationship building and liaised that process so that the, the relationships that Harvest Pierce County had built could be distributed, people could start building trust uh, with other agencies and organizations, and more importantly, the agency and organization partners could practice the ambassador model firsthand and really get practice on what it's like to um, kind of stand back and let community lead and then also be an ambassador for the community within their own agency to advocate for system change. So this is what the cultural ambassador program is today. We have 16% of our annual program participants uh, speaking a language other than English or having a low English proficiency. Um, we go through about 150 contracts per year we're kind of small, but that is a lot of contracts, um, at least for us, um, for how big we are. It's a team of like five people and my program has like two to three people uh, working on it at most um, from a staff perspective. But it's important because um, all of the money that we receive, we want to get as much of that directly to investing in community as possible. And that has been a big relationship building. Um, it, that's been a big part of the relationship building process, which I'll get into a little bit deeper later. Um, our languages are Vietnamese, Khmer, Russian, Ukrainian, Moldovan, Spanish, Lao, and Korean. And our core network, um, there are 20 cultural ambassadors, for cultural navigators, that's referring to the Latinx farm worker outreach program that uh, the farm and ag team started at PCD, um, which like is a kind of very specific offshoot. 17 grassroots organizations. We've done a lot of fiscal agenting um, for community groups for events um, as a part of like reciprocal relationship building. Um, and we have two bilingual financial counselors uh, on retainer that speak Vietnamese and Spanish. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later too, because that's been a really important part of making sure that all the community members we contract with fully understand uh, what it means to be an independent contractor and how, um, how basically receiving money from us will not damage or, or hurt their financial situation, because it could. And I'll get into that a little later too. And then 12 community ambassadors. Um, and that was the ones, the ambassadors that are ambassadoring for a particular identity or demographic group that isn't necessarily centered around uh, language. So I have this flyer up because it kind of shows like how we were originally thinking about language translation. Like I think we thought that if we just translated our flyers and our outreach materials, people would come. And if we had an interpreter sit at one of our classes, like people would come. Like the only thing keeping them from coming to our uh, events was the fact that there wasn't translation or interpretation. But I see flyers like this all the time. So this is not a language. Um, I mean, it's, it, it was, it's like might have certain words or elements that may mean something in certain language, but this is uh, basically a non-language just to show that like, um, if you see this, is there anything on here that would have you actually 
call the number or try to contact the person in order to get English interpretation services. You can see at the very bottom, it says English interpretation services available by request. We created flyers like this. I've seen flyers like this, but the opposite way where it's English and it'll be like, you know, se habla español, you know, or whatever at the bottom, but the rest of it, if you don't speak the language, there's no indication that it's something uh, people would wanna connect to. Um, I think this kind of philosophy, we made some expensive mistakes around this um, and found that it was more, um, it was better for everyone if we really custom tailored programming and outreach uh, based on feedback from the particular community that we're trying to reach um, and not from, you know, communities that we've already been designing for for so many years. So, on that note, this is our toolbox for, for multilingual outreach. It's just a few definitions of like what we use and how we use it. Um, first, you might have been, uh, you might be familiar with translation. Um, it's basically referring to written material from one language to another. Um, often people will say translation when they mean consecutive interpretation, which is basically spoken translation. So it's about, when done professionally, it's about 40 to 60 words spoken in the source language, followed by a pause, and then the interpreter conveys that message in the target language. Um, the UN and certain meetings, you'll, you'll notice like with headset interpretation, that's called simultaneous interpretation. That refers to spoken translation and the interpreter lags slightly behind the source language uh, interpreting at almost the same time as the original message is being said. And it's important to distinguish between the two of these because one is much more expensive than the other. And I mean that like expensive by what people charge and expensive by what we should pay because it is expensive energetically to do. Uh, I'm multilingual myself and I always feel like I'm in like a warg state when I try to do this because it's like I can't explain the state of mind, but it's, it's like if you're live streaming on your phone and it takes your battery out like really fast, that's what it feels like. So typically a company will um, charge you for two interpreters if you choose simultaneous interpretation because they're supposed to switch every 30 minutes to give each other a mental break. I point that out because I notice a lot of organizations are getting simultaneous interpretation and only getting one to save money. And that's putting a lot of pressure um, on the person. And sometimes interpreters will do it, but it's just good practice if we as agencies recognize and pay for and support uh, the amount of energy things like this take. So the next is transcreation. Transcreation is the tailoring of a message class or program to the cultural background of the target audience. So that is something that goes a little bit deeper to all this that leads to the actual creation of new programming, outreach methods, meeting styles, etc. And then finally, there's ambassadorship. Ambassadors do all of the above and more. Um, what they have is cultural expertise and lived experience that strategically inform outreach and program development. So often people will contact us uh, and ask if ambassadors can do these three, translation, consecutive interpretation, or simultaneous. In our own program, these are the most common for us to actually refer out to um, a translation company, especially translation. Um, translation requires computer skills, often graphic design, like working with different font sets. It's a very specialized uh, technical skill that our community members may or may not have, even if they have a lot of expertise on how this is gonna land with their audience. So we'll often pay for translation and then convene a group of ambassadors or pass it to a few ambassadors to look over the translation and let us know what kinds of changes they would suggest to localize the message specifically to Tacoma or Pierce County or wherever it is, wherever it is that we are. Because there are a lot of words that people use hyper-locally that an interpreter, like they, these companies work with people all around the world and they might not know uh, what these different things in our particular city and context are. And an ambassador would. So these are the two that we mainly rely on ambassadors for. And that's a matter of like making sure the, the right expertise is used in the right way. We do work with some ambassadors for translation because we do always prefer to pay community over um, kind of like a, a secondary or tertiary source. Um, but we don't, I wouldn't recommend starting with that. Um, it's a very particular 
and technical skill set. So lessons learned. So we co-create programming with ambassadors. But when I talked about giving things to ambassadors for review, asking them what they think about certain ideas, asking them what they think about certain data sets even, we had to gain trust and psychological safety before they'd tell us what they really think. That is super important relationship building and management of the program. Um, I have noticed when outside partners want to work with ambassadors and we bring the ambassadors to a meeting, I'll notice they'll say one thing in the meeting and then we debrief afterwards and they, they say something that maybe they weren't comfortable saying uh, in front of the agency partners. So um, don't always expect that if you put something in front of somebody, they'll tell you exactly that it might be, they might need time to think about it too. That's, that's another thing. But building psychological safety is super important part of all of this. Um, ambassadors have really interesting and creative approaches to COVID. So they really do, our uh, ambassador communities really do prefer in-person uh, type stuff. And so they've been doing like, um, they did a community cleanup, for example, uh, a couple summers ago, like right when the pandemic first happened, we were only allowed to have five people um, around at a time. And so they organized these pods, like these five person pods outdoors with masks in partnership with the health department and, and the city and other partners um, and made an event that stretched over the course of an entire week instead of just one day with a bunch of people. They had the same amount of people throughout the week uh, and got probably more done doing it that way than they would have if they just had a one day event like we would have pre pandemic times. Um, they ended up getting around three tons of trash uh, out of the river through that week. Um, and that's something that just wouldn't have even happened if we would have tried to keep it virtual, but we did it safely and we did it, you know, according to the health department guidelines at that time. Um, also things like hybrid meetings they've proposed. So that's been like technologically a feat, but just having like little pods of people and then connecting those pods through a Zoom meeting so that people who aren't technologically um, adept can participate, but in small pods, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, there's a lot of little examples like that. We're still figuring it out. Um, okay, so this is a question that we get a lot. Um, are ambassadors staff? Um, should they be staff? We have ambassadors as contractors uh, on retainer or project-based. Um, this allows for flexibility and diversity of input. So for example, I have around 19 Vietnamese people who've worked as Vietnamese ambassadors. Um, some are Vietnamese Baptist. Some are Vietnamese Buddhist. Some are a part of like the youth organizing and some are a part of, some are elders who share a very specific um, refugee experience and, and uh, time in Tacoma in particular. They're all unique communities uh, and having the flexibility to be able to say, whoever is working with us in an ambassadorial way, we want to recognize that expertise and support it. That's, that's how we tend to do it. And it's allowed us to, to really work with a diverse amount of people. Also, not all ambassadors like want a full-time job doing it necessarily. So it's, it, it kind of works uh, in both ways. Um, now, many ambassadors have never been independent contractors before. So they'll need help with things like time cards, invoices, and even financial counseling. And that's something that a good program uh, design will account for. Make sure to account for that. Don't assume that they're gonna do all of that. If you have to invoice for them, do it. Cause often if people have never been an independent contractor before, they're like shy about invoicing, or maybe it's, it's, it seems like the, the program is confusing or, they feel like, oh, like, I don't know, we just, we invoice for them. It makes it easier for both sides and we make sure they get paid as quickly as possible when we do that. I'm gonna breeze through this because I feel like I've been uh, pausing longer on slides, but this is the process. I mean, the longer we've done it, the more it's kind of like fit in with some of these human designs, human-centered design concepts, but from a community perspective. So the first and last, step of that is always empathizing. It's always trying to immerse yourself in the world of the people you're hoping to connect with. 
uncover assumptions your program or you might have had about it and observe what people do and say. Make sure you're reading every part of the situation, not just what somebody marks off on a survey. A good example of this is a survey we gave out uh, at a walkability meeting. And I later found out that um, the Vietnamese elders who were present didn't um, feel comfortable filling out surveys. They had mistrust in government surveys. They put on there, everything was great. But later when I debriefed it with them privately, they told me uh, there were a lot of things about the event that they didn't wanna be rude, but didn't go well. And I would never have known that had I not sat down with them and had a more focus group style debrief of the event rather than a survey. Uh, the other is like identify the problem. Like what really is the problem? We might not know. Uh, but they know. They may not frame it that way, but we have to listen for it. Ask and deeply listen. What, what cultural pain points might exist? Always be looking for this, and you're going to learn more and more with your ambassadors each time what those might be. What's possible? You can ideate with ambassadors. Uh, why hasn't the problem been solved before now? Another good thing to ask is, has it been solved before now? Because a lot, especially immigrant and refugee communities, they've been solving uh, their own problems and in different ways uh, since, they've, since they've been here. A good example is food deserts. There's a lot of amazing food innovation that's already happening in areas that have been called food deserts. What is that? How can we support it? How can we levy that momentum rather than getting in the way of it um, with you know, permits and procedures and, and things like that? So being creative about what the problem even is. Uh, account for power dynamics. What's uniquely in your organization's wheeled house? What do people actually need to know? Don't overflow with information. I'm not doing a good example of, of that here, but you know, don't fire hose the information. Collaborate, try out smaller versions of the idea. Watch community interact. Make sure at least one ambassador observes two. And then the debriefing is important. You wanna debrief with the ambassador with the team and with the partic participants all separately. And that all falls into creating that psychological safety that I mentioned earlier. That's where you can identify systemic pain points and changes. And that's what it's your job as an ambassador for the community you just connected with, to go ambassador within your own agency to advocate for those changes, those pain points stop happening. That builds trust. And then you go back to empathize, where you reflect and ground truth your reflections with ambassadors. So if you can institutionalize iteration like this in your programming, it'll be constantly getting better and updating to the dynamic needs of the communities you connect with. So compensating community. Often, I created the word ambassador, but it's a role that we see um, in communities all the time. It's somebody who's acting as that in between, kind of that go between for their community uh, and any group or agency. Uh, and they are often the one person, like if they're called to a meeting, who is unpaid or who is a volunteer, especially in a multilingual context. Often, if people are volunteer interpreting, for example, uh, we literally can't do our jobs without them, like literally cannot do our jobs without them. And their lived experience in that culture is something that no degree uh, can give us if we did not actually live that experience. That is extremely valuable. We value it as a professional service. Um, we don't pay stipends necessarily. We modeled the pricing structure off of translator and interpreter dispatching companies, knowing that the interpreters that work for those companies make a small fraction, but they get benefits, they're full time, all those things. Um, we budgeted for the full amount and if we need to hire someone from the dispatch company as a backup, we already have a budget for it. But in general, we pay that full amount to ambassadors, knowing that they are taking care of their own overhead uh, and making sure that they understand um, how it might be taxed, you know, things like that. That has amounted to at least $50 an hour for interpretation. I'm throwing that number out there just as an example so you can see uh, kind of a starting place. Um, I think in certain contexts, it could and should be more. We're not necessarily that flush as an organization, but that is what uh, the company that we work with tends to charge. And so that's what we tend to pay uh, for interpreters. We will pay more if it's simultaneous, that's around $75. And it also depends on the, the language too. Different languages um, are, they charge them differently depending on 
uh, their needs, but in general, it's that. And understanding there's little support out there for independent contractors. Um, we know that if we're working with people who are low income or who are seniors or um, who have an ITIN number, but not necessarily a social security number, we can still contract with them. But if they're on certain benefits, we might be throwing them over a benefits cliff without realizing it. They might not even know about that cliff. We can't legally ask them about it. We can't give them tax advice. Uh, and also it wouldn't, we can't, it wouldn't be appropriate for, for us to ask them about things like their uh, legal status or about um, the benefits they're on. But we do contract with financial counselors who do do that. And in particular, there are a lot of financial counseling um, places that, that work with community, like nonprofits that, that work with community. And it's often about financial health, which is very different than uh, what it takes to be an independent contractor. That's a very specific tax uh, world. So I would urge you to try to find someone who really specifically knows about the gig economy, how to help Uber drivers. Things like that is what's going to apply to compensating community members at this level. Um, we include one free hour um, with a financial counselor with everyone who comes on as a contractor so that they can understand how it's going to impact them. And then we have them sign the personal services agreement because then it's informed consent. Um, gift cards, compensating with gift cards is hard for a lot of government ent entities. Um, a little bit more on that later, but that is the way that a lot of people prefer to get paid. We have to do it through a check. And so that's why it becomes complicated uh, about compensating people. So what's next? And this is my last slide. So um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I, this is the last one. What's next is uh, kind of a wish list for both what I hope to be doing on Monday like from Monday forward, and also what I hope people here will join us to work on, because it's gonna take all of us. We are all highlighting these pain points when we work with community, and we can all go back within our organizations and figure out how to restructure them to actually allow for working directly with community members. Um, for example, we do participatory budgeting with community members. Um, are the power dynamics level so that if a community comes up with any idea, we can respond to it. In many cases, uh, we're not quite there yet. So what's next? We're hoping that we all can cut like within Pierce County, this is very county specific, but hoping that we can all have a shared language access policy. Um, we're trying to develop that together and that we can streamline and adopt it um, instead of having kind of a model, like everybody's kind of doing a one-off approach. Remember, the US does not have an official language. If you are a public servant, it is your job to make sure you're communicating with everybody uh, in your municipality and not just the people who can speak the language that you speak. Gifting public funds interpretation refinement. So that's the problem with gift cards or can be the problem with gift cards. It can even be the problem with uh, donating space in a community center for a particular community group. It could be considered gifting public funds. I've seen the interpretation of gifting public funds get in the way of a lot of community stuff and a lot of public good. So how can we streamline our interpretation of public good, especially now that people are moving to try to compensate and work with community members on a deeper level? I feel like we're all on a similar page around this, so it's a good time for us to maybe um, see what that was trying to protect and, and come up with a new definition together. Preparing for participatory budgeting across our agencies. Can community groups receive funds up front? So in the city of Tacoma, for example, they have to be reimbursed uh, legally for everything. We can't give money until they've shown that they've done work or have receipts for it. But if it's a $10,000 grant and you're specifically targeting low-income communities, they're not gonna have that to put up front. And so they're not gonna be able to actually even participate in the granting program. Are there more things like that? Are there more rules like that? Where it's, it's well-intentioned, but because of one of our rules or our structural, uh, requirements, we actually are missing huge swaths of, of the population, and especially marginalized populations. Shared procurement policies that center and invest in the capacity of women and minority on business enterprises. So a lot of that has to do with like insurance umbrellas. And you'll learn if you start compensating community members as consultants and working with them in that way, 
that will highlight a lot of pain points within your own organization that will be similar for small and burgeoning new businesses and consultants. Uh, for example, what if you treated uh, the people you're hoping to reach out to as consultants with expertise, um, but they aren't going to give you rates. They haven't necessarily built their business that way yet. Like, how can you be a part of building the capacity of those businesses rather than waiting until they're at the level where they can understand our invoicing software and, and how the game works? We can rewrite the rules. Um, it's all human made, you know, human interpreted. So, um, yeah, user friendly invoicing and data sharing agreements. Okay. So one of the reasons why we, um, there's so much survey fatigue, a lot of times different agencies are asking the same question over and over and over. What if we shared all of our data? Um, we ask the question once and then share it with relevant parties. Um, also, what if we look at community owned data and make sure that the community them communities themselves, if they're collecting data about themselves, we elevate that and actually have a framework within our systems to be able to take community generated reports and act on them and count that as data. That includes traditional ecological knowledge and community owned data, which have their own ethical um, frameworks. I could probably do a whole thing on that. So I won't get into that, but just expanding our definition of what data means and how to um, honor any feedback that we receive from community. And that is it. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I see, I haven't looked at the chat, so. So yeah, I think I just see one uh, true question coming in there and lots of kudos and compliments. Um, so one question that I see is, do you have any suggestions uh, on how to start to reach out to people who might be interested in being ambassadors, but you might not have that network or relationship already? If we don't have existing relationships within the community. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people start off um, going to a place like Centro de la Raza or Centro Latino, like there's often a place um, that it like hosts the, kind of concerns of a community um, identity group that you can start with, that often is only one aspect of what the fullness of that community identity is. So it can be a starting place. Uh, and I would, I would just recommend don't like start and end there. Don't just say, yeah, I, contract, I contacted this one place. We have, we're sending them a flyer in Spanish and they invited me to a meeting and like that checks the box, you know? Each um, interaction is uh, an opportunity to dig deeper. I would say, if you ever go to those meetings and somebody invites you somewhere else, go, even if it doesn't seem like it relates to your work at all, that's some important relationship building stuff. Often when we invite people to, to our meetings, they don't necessarily see why they need to be there in some cases, especially if it's about like heavy technical stuff. In the same way, if they're inviting you to something and you're like, oh, that's not in my work plan or it's kind of scope creep or it's outside of what I do, go anyway, because you might know the exact people they need to connect to. And it's a uh, it's an opportunity to network, basically. Um, I've been to a lot of events where I don't speak the language and I would stay the whole time because FaceTime is important. And even though, you know, somebody did invite me, so I'd be there with somebody, but it's important to just have a presence in whatever way that you can. So if somebody goes some, I asked you to go somewhere, um, go is, is one of the first things that I would say. Excellent. Well, um, I see that we were a little ambitious with the agenda today. So we really only have about 15 to 20 minutes for breakouts. So I think, um, at this time, I'd like to transition. We'll have just a little break. Um, I think we'll go to 11.45, but just really wanted to say thank you to all the panelists. I thought um, every presentation was really fantastic. I learned a lot um, and I hope that you all did as well. Um, at this time, uh, we will take a break till 11.45 if you uh, need to go take care of some business, but yeah, we'll come back please. And we'll have about 15 minutes for uh, a little bit of a discussion 
um, focus kind of just on what you would like to see uh, as resources and kind of other things related to that. So uh, reconvene in about four minutes. We'll see you all soon. All right. See everyone is starting to come back to the main room. Don't have uh, very much to say at this point, but did just want to say thank you to everyone for sticking around for the full two hours today. Um, as a follow up, this is, or we will post the event recording and the notes in the presentations um, from the, uh, to our website following the event. So likely on Monday. Um, and just as a final word, this is our last peer networking event of the year. So no uh, news to provide on 2022 events yet, but um, we'll have something uh, soon. And if you have any ideas or uh, wanna chat about anything interesting you think would be a good topic for next year, please get in touch with me. My name is Ben Kahn, email is bkahn at psrc.org. And with that, uh, everyone have a really wonderful Friday and Halloween weekend. Take care. <laughs>